Okay, so moving on. Um, once you're done with that video, just kind of reflect for a second. What did you think about it? Um, you know, actually, I realized I forgot to tell you a bit about what you were supposed to be doing there. Um, so my apologies. But just try to think back, and you could actually go and watch the video again if you want. That might be better. And just count the number of aggressive behaviors that you see. So yeah, either whichever you want, just think back or go ahead and watch the video again um, and count the number of aggressive behaviors you see. Um, once you're done with that, just pause the video and do that and then uh, resume the video. So um, the problem is that, I mean, we can't really do this so clearly because we don't, we're not in person. Um, but what I would have you do is actually compare your number of aggressive behaviors um, with someone else from the class. And what you'll very likely find is that you each come up with different numbers. So this kind of illustrates what the problem can be if you don't, or very often is rather, if you don't clearly define what your measures are when you're using observation. So again, I can't show the video because they'll hit me with copyright, but um, what exactly qualifies as an aggressive behavior? There was a part in the beginning where the kid just walks by and they uh, like they make a snide comment to him. Well, does that count as aggression? Some people probably counted it. Some people probably didn't count it. Um, another issue is what about repeated issues? Like, are you counting the same behavior more than once? Um, for example, they several different people threw paper at the at the kid. Um, that needs to be clearly defined. So. One person might say, oh, there were five aggressive behaviors because they threw five pieces of paper at them. One, another person might say, oh, there's, there was one aggressive behavior there because um, it was, was kind of all part of one event, so to speak. And then lastly, who's being aggressive? Because at the end, um, the kid takes out the stick and starts hitting the bullies with it. So you could run into that issue as well as... Um, who is who's kind of being aggressive there? The video kind of implies that it's just just the bullies, but maybe it's the other the kid as well. So again, this is kind of just meant to illustrate how things can go wrong when you don't very clearly define, don't clearly operationalize the behaviors in question. Um, when you leave it very open to um, personal opinion, then it becomes becomes unclear unclear because you end up with different ratings or different counts depending on who's watching it, right? So how do we get around these issues? Well, like we talked about, we wanna, um, of course, have clearly defined behavior. So think of that one, we would of course wanna say, okay, it's the number of, assuming this is the issue, what you really wanna study, the number of violent attacks, okay, or the number of, even better, the number of um, physical altercations. You could even build on that even more a bit. But again, just saying aggression is too, too open to interpretation. Um, another thing is, of course, that your observers have to be well-trained. So when you do an observational measure, typically what happens is you go, if you're like a professor, you'll have your grad students do it. You'll you have your grad students watch and run the experiment um, and, uh, um, and keep track of the behaviors, but you'll, of course, train them on what exactly the behaviors are and what they should be looking at. Um, but there's also other ways we can examine our reliability of our observers. And again, all this applies to um, open-ended questions as well. So there's a few different things related to inter-rater reliability that we'll talk about next. And it's just different measures of, are we getting the same thing consistently from different people? Um, so there's three different methods that you can use. There's percent agreement, Cohen's kappa, and Pearson correlation, which we'll go into each of these. So percent agreement is pretty straightforward, but it has limitations. This is just gonna be the total number, a percentage of agreements um, 
for the total number of behaviors. And you want to shoot for at least 70%. Okay. So basically this one, this one's pretty straightforward. So you just, if you have two codes, so non-aggressive and aggressive behaviors. Um, so if research assistant or researcher one says that there's one aggressive behavior here and then the rest are non-aggressive, researcher two says this one's not aggressive, these are all not aggressive, the agreement here is gonna be 90%. Okay, so you're just gonna look at the same behavior and see, each of the same behaviors rather, and see how many, how many times do they agree divided by the total number of behaviors. Okay, so obviously this one's a disagreement, but so this one, this one here, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So they agree at 90%. Okay, pretty straightforward. Um, one thing to keep it to keep in mind though is that percent agreement can be a bit misleading depending on um, how frequent the behavior is. So for example, in this, in this one, um, I mean, it's a simple method, which is nice, but it really doesn't tell you that much about how much agreement there is. I mean, there's only one time when they disagree, but also there's very little aggressive behavior to even factor in, right? So in other words, because there's only one instance of aggressive behavior, or at least researcher one thinks there is, there's really only one chance for them to disagree, right? Whereas if all the others are clearly non-aggressive behavior, well then maybe they agree, but again, it's just because aggressive behavior is so rare. So that's where um, percent agreement can be a bit misleading. Again, if you have very lopsided behaviors where it's not occurring very frequently, um, you can get the impression like you, like your researcher, researchers are in agreement even when they might not be. Um, another, a better measure is known as Cohen's Kappa. And this is just, it's percent agreement, but it's also um, taking into account the amount of agreement due to chance. Okay. So for example, and this kind of factors in what we're talking about here, where you're kind of considering the prevalence of the, of the, the behavior. Um, for example, if you were to toss two coins, totally independent events, what is the probability that they'll agree just due to chance? Versus if you roll two dice, what is the probability that they'll agree? Um, it's gonna be lower because there's more outcomes in a dice roll. Um, you don't have to know how this is calculated. That's gonna be on throughout the course, um, but just, just be aware of this, that Cohen's cap is a measure of re reliability that takes into account um, the probability, the amount of agreement due to chance. Okay. All right, and then the last one, and this one is is a good one. It's probably probably the most common used, I would think. Um, this is just going to be where you compute the correlation between researcher one and researcher two's ratings for all the participants. Um, so when re reviewer one or researcher one says there's a lot of aggressive behavior, does reviewer two also say that? Um, it's a simple and easy method. And like I said, pretty commonly used. Now, when it comes to this, you wanna have two things. You wanna have a significant correlation between the two researchers, but you also wanna have a non-significant t-test. Okay. So if you remember back to correlations, correlation is, is just that as one variable goes up, the other one goes up or, or possibly goes down in a predictable way. Now we're of course wanting a pot, so that would be positive and negative correlations. We of course want a positive correlation here because if we have a negative correlation, that would mean that the reviewers are going in opposite direction. The, sorry, the researchers are going in opposite directions. Um, so yeah, we would want a significant correlation between the two researchers, right? So if, again, if reviewer one, I don't know why I keep saying reviewer, but if researcher one um, says that there were eight aggressive behaviors, well then 
uh, researcher two should say there's something close to that. Researcher one says there was three aggressive behaviors, then researcher two should say something close to that. Okay, And that would produce a significant correlation between their ratings. I'll just show you what that looks like before I get to the t-test part. So if uh, rater one or researcher one um, is given various ratings, rater two's um, measurements should be pretty close to that, like you see here. I don't know what the correlation is here, but it's um, it's pretty uh, pretty strong. So they're they're basically the the relationship between them is pretty pretty close, um, and they're giving the same same metrics over the same um, behavior, right? Which is what we want. So again, to put that in, in context or practical example, Rater one is saying that, okay, I counted, you know, four aggressive behaviors. Rater two is saying the same thing. Rater one is saying, oh, I counted five. Rater two is saying something pretty close to that, um, which would be six, or sorry, Rater two is, Rater one is saying six, Rater two is saying five. But, you get the point. Basically, their their uh, scores are are quite similar, and that indicates that they're measuring things, quantifying things in a very similar fashion because their measurements are so similar. Now, the other part is we also want to have a non-significant t test. So it's also possible that um, the two ratings or the two researchers might be correlated, but also be using different um, different parts of the scale, so to speak. So let me give you an example of that. Um, I'll actually show you the Excel file here. So in this example, we would have, um, sorry, good correlation, a good correlation, but also a non-significant t-test. So again, you see how their values are, are very close to one another and they do actually correlate. This is the correlation here. But the second part is that they also don't presumably differ statistically, like if you were to run a t-test. So the well, there is a possibility that um, the two might be correlated, but kind of happen on other ends of the scale. So for example, well, I'll look at, we'll look at this one here. Um, you might find that reviewer, sorry, rater one, is giving higher ratings on average than um, Rater 2, like you see here. So although they're correlated, um, the Y, like you see here, as one goes up, the other one tends to go up as well. The actual means of the two um, ratings are quite different. So this, this one here, the Y values, the uh, Rater 1, are on average quite lower than the X values of Rater 2. So there's the means right here. You notice how, all, again, although they're correlated, like you see here um, and here, on average, um, Rater, Rater 1 is giving much lower ratings. And we don't want that either. And that's what we mean by the t-test. So not just are they correlated, but are they also um, close to one another? Because they can be correlated, but still be different, right? Um, if they're just happening on other ends of the scale. So for example, I'll show you this again. Um, notice how they're basically, these values are um, the same, but minus, minus three here. So seven um, for X, they give seven, for Y they give four. For X, they give six, for Y they give three. For X, they give four, um, for Y they give one. So they are correlated, but basically a way to think about this is um, one rater has a, a different kind of starting point, right? A different average. And that's again going to still give us a, a positive correlation, but it would not give us a insignificant t-test because look at the means here. This one again would give us a positive, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, this one would give us a positive correlation, but also no difference between the averages. Okay, hopefully that made sense. Okay. Um, so that's Pearson's correlation. Again, just looking at, do the two, two, do, the two different researchers give the same ratings and do they give correlated ratings? Because that's what we want. Um, and there's a couple different ways you can improve on this idea of inter-rater reliability. 
again, one is to develop a good coding scheme. So just you know, precisely define what it is they're measuring rather than leaving it open to interpretation. Um, and a good way to do this is to look at the literature. So chances are um, if someone, if you're studying something that someone else has studied before, which is often the case, others have, others have tried this and they've found what appear to be good metrics or good, um, good measures of behavior that you know, show pretty good reliability, inter-rater reliability. Um, the other one is to pilot test. So remember that when you uh, run a study, sometimes what you'll do is, is just run a pilot first. So if you're planning on collecting 100 subjects, you might run 10 first and just see how that goes. See, are there any problems with the study? Are there any changes you need to make um, before you collect the rest of your data? That's pilot test. Well, going hand in hand with that, um, the pilot test can also kind of expose um, or make clear what might be issues with your behavioral metric, okay? So if you pilot, say, 10 people before running the full study, it might occur to you that, well, gee, this, this one behavior is very much open to interpretation or this needs a more precise definition. Um, like, again, like we talked about with throwing the paper, so that might, come, that might show up in a pilot test. And then you can make a decision about, well, okay, how do I, how do I score that? Is that one aggressive behavior because it was a whole bunch of paper thrown or is that five different aggressive behaviors because it was five pieces of paper thrown? That's something you can figure out, hopefully with a pilot test, kind of a trial run. Um, again, keep it as specific as possible. The more specific, the better. Um, but you also don't want to lose, don't want to lose um, important behaviors that, that might be relevant. And then lastly, just providing examples can be very helpful. So if you're training a, a researcher to measure a behavior, just giving specific examples helps a lot as well. Okay. Um, okay. And then the last one is just, um, again, train your raters. So we talked about that. And then just monitor your raters. So look out for something um, called drift to see kind of are they are they staying consistent or are they you know diverging at some point. Um, and then the last one, this is kind of you don't have to worry about drift. We we'll, won't we'll really get into that. Um, and then the last one is to prevent bias, and this is this is very important as well. Um, the thing with inter-rater reliability is it is going to add a lot of noise to your experiment, a lot of kind of extraneous variables, but what can be even worse and kind of turned out into a confound is if raters are not blind to the conditions, okay? So um, when you run a study, you don't want, um, you don't want the, the people watching the behavior to be aware of what condition is what, because they're gonna, even without them meaning to be probably be they're probably going to be influenced by the what they expect to happen so for example if you run some sort of study on aggression and your one condition to what you're expecting to show more aggression well if your researchers are aware of that and they know okay they just did the aggression condition i'm thinking they're going to show more aggression that might come out, that might be kind of a placebo effect, right? They might not actually be showing more aggression, but just the expectation of it causes your researchers to record more instances of aggression. So that's something we need to be aware of as well. Um, ideally, yeah, you keep them blind to, to the conditions. So maybe one researcher is gonna, say you have three researchers, one is gonna implement the manipulation and then the other two are going to record the behavior, um, but they don't get to see the manipulation part. So they don't know what, what condition they're evaluating. That would help a lot. That's kind of what they do with a lot of drug treatments. So you've probably heard of double blind placebos. That's where, that's kind of the best scenario, the double blind placebo. That means that both the researcher and the participant are not aware of the conditions. 
So in a lot of psych experiments, the participant is not aware of the conditions, but the researcher might be. It's best if we can keep the researcher in the dark too. So say you're running um, some sort of experiment on, I don't know, um, so, some sort of like facial, facial cream, right? To see if it, I don't know, gets rid of scars. Well, if your researcher knows that, knows which condition is which, which cream is actually cream and which is a placebo, that could very much influence them, right? So they might know that, oh, this, you know, this person got the actual treatment cream and kind of just that expectation, that confirmation bias is going to lead them to say, when they look at the people's scars, say, oh yeah, they faded more just because of their expectation. So bottom line, keep your raters in the dark whenever possible. Um, then the last thing to keep in mind is that you want to allow participants to get, to, uh, get used to being watched. So this is kind of a tricky one because it depends on the nature of the study and how you're going to implement it. But we want to avoid reactivity, meaning we want to um, we want to make sure that the participants are not, you know, behaving the way you expect them to, or kind of being influenced by the fact that you know, they know they're going to, they know they're being watched, right? So that's that's something to be aware of as well. Okay, that's it for observations. Um, it's kind of a short one. Uh, I think next up is ethics.